original investigators believe he murdered her. They yeah. just can't prove it. It's my first initial call to the private investigator working on my dad's case. My wife jumps up from the table and says, Oh my God, who is this man coming in the backyard? I divorced him because I couldn't trust him at all. He lied to me at the very beginning. He was living two separate lives. In the water about 30 yards away, and identified it as it was a person. So I just want to give a quick warning at the beginning of this episode for two things. One, we go into a little bit about the damage to Carolyn's body after she was found. And it's not too descriptive. The only descriptions we go into are the ones that are necessary for explaining the injuries and why they concern us. So I just want to give everyone a heads up that that is in this episode though and sprinkled throughout this episode. So if you're sensitive about that, I just wanted to give a warning. There is also two videos that were shot over a decade ago that we're going to show, and they're a little bit jarring to watch. We do feel like that they were extremely necessary to put in here, but we do not want people to repeat the behavior. So we kind of battled back and forth a little bit if we should post them, but I think it's necessary to understand how quickly someone can be incapacitated. So I will give a warning right before we show those two videos back to back, so that way if you want to skip ahead to after the videos, you can. No one's hurt in the videos, but it does appear that someone is hurt, even though both people in the videos are fine and gave us permission to use the videos. But it does look like they're harmed, so I just want to kind of give a heads up that that will be in this episode, and I will give you a heads up right before that plays, so that if you choose to skip those videos, you can. And what, I mean, what was that for you like to find a body. I mean, that must have been frightening. Kind of a nauseous. You just don't know how to process it. You don't come up, you know, upon that. In your life, it's very highly unusual. Yeah. Having a medical background, I'm a nurse anesthetist. I've seen trauma and I've seen a lot of things. I've been doing it 18 years. I can tell you two things. Number one, what I found on the report saying that she had a circumferential bruising on both the supra and infraorbital eye. I'm not a forensic expert, but what I do know is, is that you do not obtain that kind of bruising when you drown in water. It's not post-mortem. It is what I consider pre-mortem. Again, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not a forensic scientist. But what I do know, practicing in field and seeing trauma, is that those kind of bruising occur before death. They're pre-mortem. I can't imagine someone having a precise left bruised eye that drowned and is found face down on the shore that they have just a single bruise on one part of the face. Typically when there's trauma or near water, there should be uh, adequate swelling within the tissues and the bruising is usually a different color. That type of bruising that was described to me sounds like very much pre-mortem. How she got that, I do not know. That's what doesn't add up to me. They found her with her bathing suit on. Um, according to his testimony on the tape, it said that he dragged her in the water to try to keep her afloat by her, her bikini. Carolyn jumped in the water at the end of a fantastic day of boating, which we both usually do. Normally the ladder is down and she holds on to it. She did this on that day, 530 days ago, but this time she didn't realize that the wind was blowing hard one way and the tide was going the other, taking us deeper into the bay. 
The pictures attached were taken minutes before she and I went into the water. Texted a few of them to Keith right before. They are attached. Keith has our texts from that day still. You should talk with him. We were having a fantastic day. As soon as Carolyn was in the water, the boat and I were a good ways from her. She yelled to me to help and I jumped in after her, leaving the dogs on the boat. As soon as I got to her, I saw that the boat was headed away from us and I asked her if I could go get the boat and come back to her and she said, please don't leave me. I didn't and then I spent the next few hours in the water holding Carolyn up and pulling her along by her bikini strap, fighting the wind, waves and current several miles from shore. I lost her in the waves after a few hours. I'm fat, so I floated around for several more hours. If you got a, uh, her bikini strap and you're treading somebody in the water, that's gonna leave an indentation in the skin. You're gonna have redness and uh, markings and that bikini may not hold up. So if you're pulling someone in a wave with wind, you're gonna stretch the hell out of that. The bikini was intact according to what the officers reported. So if he's pulling her by a bikini, unless it's a very thick, strong bikini, that usually will either come off or it will be severely stretched. And it probably won't stay on the body. Again, I'm not an expert, but logically just thinking about it, if you're tugging on somebody in the water, you have resistance and that resistance turns into stretching like a rubber band, right? And if you're holding on clothing, that clothing is gonna give and it's gonna stretch. And it's not gonna be very form-fitting after a while if you're in the water for two hours and you're, you're pulling that person and yet they found the body was intact on her. Again, it's a little bit, that's a little bit odd. Again, I'm going by his testimony, what he said. I'm going by his words and looking at what they found. Hey. Hey. How you feeling? Oh my God, I feel like shit. Oh man, I'm so sorry. So it's just the amount of support out here is almost overwhelming. Ugh. Yeah. I, I'm like super, super happy um, and also really sad at the same time. I know it doesn't have the same impact on me, but yesterday was hard. Cause I know obviously it's Carolyn's life that we're fighting for, but sometimes I get wrapped up in the fact that we're investigating a crime, right? And so I get excited when we have the little windfalls, but yesterday was one of those moments, which always happens where I'm like, oh my God. I think seeing the pictures was just a very, very harsh reality check. And her, I mean, I can't even tell you, Brie, her swimsuit was like perfectly on her. There is not a smidgen out of place. It is just, I don't know. They found her face down on the shore in 18 inches of water. That's where she washed up. When they turned the body over, there was, of course, rigor mortis. They did notice that there was a circumferential bruising on the left eye. How she got it, don't know. But it's not consistent, as far as I'm concerned, with postmortem drowning in water. That's blunt trauma. And in order for tissue to get bruised like that, there has to be blunt force. So if she jumped off the boat, okay, and cleared the boat, like he said, then she sh entered the water, right? So if she jumped off the boat and hit the boat with her, on her face, then certainly there would be bruising. But she evidently cleared the boat, according to him. Now, did she get poked in the eye in the water? Never said that. So I'm assuming is how did she get the bruise? Again, that's an unanswered question. That's pretty much looking at the evidence, both the audio, what the officers found, and also the bruising. The bruising is probably the most concerning part for me, is that how did the bruise get there? Something doesn't match up. It just doesn't match up. That's what I'm saying. You're seeing a lot of consistency within this, this scenario is things are not adding up. The, there's a not... There's a consistency, but then there's not a consistency. There's a contradiction in terms. There's contradictions in stories. There's a contradiction in timelines. There's a lot, a lot of contradictions going on here, and it just doesn't add up. The police were very nice. They came and uh, they asked questions, well, you know, about the weather, about if I had any security cameras. They were sh looking out at the waves because they were told that they it was a pontoon boat accident, and uh, the lady went swimming, 
and the boat got away from him. And um, it was unusual for me to think that anybody who had any boating experience would not anchor their boat if they were going to go swimming yeah. because the winds were blowing. It wasn't white capped and like, you know, 30 mile an hour winds, but the winds were moving. The boat was going to move. Yeah. There's no question about it. Or tether themselves somehow to it, you know. I found that to be kind of unusual that anybody would not want to have the boat or let that boat get away. But we went into his bedroom, we closed the door, and then he told me what, what happened. We were alone at the time. He told me he washed up on the beach and on, on the shore yeah. and that they intubated him on the shore and that he had, he had water in his lungs and um, that they took him to the hospital. I didn't ask him any further. I assume they took the tube out at a certain length of time. I didn't get into details with him. But then now I've heard that none of that really happened. The sun was going down. So I stopped floating and let myself go. My feet hit sand and I was able to make it to shore. It was already dark. I collapsed on the back porch of someone's house. The boat with the dogs in it, with the engine still running, washed up five hours later by Ono Island. The rest is all known to each of you. triaged him and they found him stable and, and evidently just wasn't in critical condition. And if he was intubated, you would have an ambulance going to the hospital, he'd be bagged on a ventilator and he would be in an ICU. And he wouldn't be conscious. Because anytime you intubate somebody, pretty much when you intubate them, that means they're in respiratory failure. That means they don't have enough oxygen in their body. And most of the time people have no recall because their, their brain is getting less oxygen and so you put a tube in to oxygenate them and to preserve the body and also the brain. So a lot of people have some recollection, but most of them don't. Most of them are either, if their vitals are stable, they'll either, they'll be unconscious and you're breathing for them or they'll give them some kind of medicine in transport to keep him calm and to keep him from, you know, not thrashing or, or, or bucking on the tube, the breathing tube. That's if he had true lung and water in his lungs. If you have water in your lungs, you have to intubate them because then they're not going to maintain their oxygenation. You, you have to tube them. You have to put a tube in or else they're going to die. So intubation is a pretty serious thing. I mean, you don't take that lightly. That is done when something life-threatening is happening, when you know their airway is compromised and they're just not going to oxygenate. And that, that's an emergency situation. So I just wanted to break into the episode really quick and remind everybody, if you haven't seen season one, The Disappearance of Robert B., please go back and watch that. It's a very interesting series. It's still going on. We are releasing the episodes a little bit slower because the investigation has slowed down after we released all of our information, but we are still releasing episodes on that. So if you want to catch up through season one, uh, there are 21 episodes up on that right now. So definitely go back and watch season one. Season three will be being announced next month. It is a very big case and we think we'll definitely be able to offer some help on it. And then I also just wanted to remind you to subscribe if you can. If you subscribe, you get to see episodes early, you get discounts on merchandise, you get to be part of our private subscribers Facebook group. And then you also get to see some behind the scenes footage, uncut interviews. And we try to do a Facebook Live per month for subscribers only. And during that Facebook Live, you can ask questions to us directly. And because it's a smaller group, we'll be able to answer everybody's questions. Please understand we don't make any profit on this show. All the money goes back into trying to solve these cases. So if you have the means to help support the show, we would be very grateful. We have to output a lot of resources in order to investigate these cases properly and to get the information that we need accurately. So if you can help, please do. And if not, of course, the show will always be available to the public. You just get a few extra perks if you subscribe. And now back to the show. Where she was found to get her out of the water was going to be a little difficult on my property because I have a, a break wall and it would have been hard to kind of lift her out and put her over the break wall. So the neighbor next door down uh, has a little bit of a boat ramp. And so they kind of walked her, floated her over to the boat ramp and brought her up on shore there. And how long were the cops, do you know, about out here with her? They were here over four hours. Between the initial police coming 
the investigators coming, the medical examiner coming, all the photos, a lot of conversation. Then a, a white van came that took her to the morgue or to wherever they take people they find. I also know he's very strong. I had him do a, a military um, hold on me and I passed out, you know, when you cut off the carotids. He said he knew how to do that. He did it twice on me, I just wanted to know. At the house, and we did a control, and I, and I went out, but he did, he, he got me in the hole, and he, he said he learned that in the Coast Guard. And I went out within a matter of less than 10 seconds. And it probably didn't leave any bruising? Or? No, no, there's no bruising, I passed it out. I just wanted to know, he goes, I can do that. I say, could I experience that? He goes, okay. He goes, I'm warning you, you're gonna pass out. He goes, I know how to do it correctly. And he did, he, he, he did it correctly. And I said, go, and he did it. Next thing you know, I was out, I dropped. And he did it in the house, Carolyn was there. And he did it very quickly. He knew exactly how to do it. It didn't leave marks on me at all. I had no markings. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, all you're doing is compressing the carotid artery. You out and you yeah. drop, and then you wake up within a matter, probably within 10 seconds. But his grip was very tight. He's got strong arms. His arms are strong. When he locked in there on that, and he had me like that, I went out within five seconds. I was down. I was out. I saw like white and then went out. That's all I remember. It was the weirdest feeling. He knew how to do it very, very precise. How easy would that be? I mean, just like, imagine if you and Josh were in the water and Josh decided to just pull you under. And you weren't expecting it, right? Like yeah. how quickly, or if he did a choke hold, I mean, and then shove someone under the water, so you do the choke hold and then you just hold them under the water. I mean, it would take a minute, maybe, and they would, you wouldn't even have time to struggle because, right, you'd be taken so off guard because, like, you don't think the person you're with is going to kill you. So I just want to be really clear here that what's on these videos we don't think is funny. We don't think you should ever repeat. This is not something you should ever do at home. Please understand that these were teenagers who had just joined the military and kind of thought this was funny, but we don't think this is funny. We don't think this is condonable, and we do ask everyone to never do this at home and never try to repeat it. There is no reason to try to do this. Hi guys, this is me getting choked the fuck out. I'm drunk as shit right now. Ready? Deuces. <laughs> this. Think. <laughs> 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 it's not bad. Dude, that was fucking bad. He's out. He's out. Army versus army action, baby. <laughs> what? He's still out of it. Dude, I have no idea what to say. <laughs> Holy shit, he's really out. Yeah. <laughs> there he goes. Come <laughs> on. PFC, everybody get choked the fuck out by PFC. What's your last name? Blankenfeld. Blankenfeld. Go. Yeah. I know. You don't know what the fuck's happening. He's out. He's out. He's out. He's out. He's out. I just wanted to include this picture because I feel like the choking videos are a little bit jarring. This is the day after those videos were taken. As you can see, both guys are fine and still doing fine today. So I just wanted to show that so that everybody knows no one was hurt or nothing was damaged for those videos. So the rest of the trip here, we've got, uh, we've got Ray Evans who worked with uh, Chris. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so he's coming over today and we're interviewing him. Ray Evans is probably the nicest person I've ever met. Really? He's a big teddy, he's a big teddy bear. Nice. Do you work with Chris and for how long? I worked at Austo USA, where's where Chris was, and we worked there together for about nine years. 
When I was originally hired there, I was hired in as their fire chief and safety coordinator. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris came in later on, uh, a couple of years later, was hired in as a safety manager. In the beginning, uh, the team was small. There was probably only about uh, two or three of us. And then eventually we had it grown out to, there was about 20 of us. Nice. So was, did he manage that whole team? Yes, he managed those 20 people. Okay. And when you, how long have you not worked there for? Because you're not there now, right? That's correct. I haven't worked there for about mm, two and a half years. Okay. But I guess just from working with him standpoint, not anything involving Carolyn, but how was he as a boss or? He was an individual that was, uh, without trying to ramble too much, he was highly narcissistic. He was, uh, you know, really into himself, obviously. So it was hard to work with because some days, you know, he would be, your best friend for an hour and the next moment you're getting yelled and screamed at so it was a very tough situation like actually yelling oh yeah screaming oh and yelling yes really? yes yes and you know wow. i was directly under him and so uh it was a hard job because many times people would do the the most minor item and he'd call me in to tell me to fire them and i go chris we can't fire him for that come on now and then you know, it was it was just it was very hard. Were there ever people fired that you felt like shouldn't have been, or it never actually no, got to that no, point? Okay. Never got to that point. Okay, it was just more of like the, the right, idle right. threat kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There'd be times when people would do wrong, and he would have me write them up, and he would even help with the the written documentation. And then when we had to interview the people, he suddenly would flip, and he's on the people side, even though he told me he wanted them, and. I, after the second time him doing that, I said, no more, I'm not doing this anymore because you're making me look bad. And his philosophy was, well, I do that so that the people as an employee feel like they're being treated fairly and they have a way out. And he was a, a master manipulator. And there was a short period of time when he first got there, he and I were uh, real close friends. I fell into that, well, okay, you know. And then um, I started seeing some things that I was became concerned about. One day, uh, Carolyn's twin brother uh, bought a uh, indoor gym set from me and uh, I tore it down. I was gonna build it in his house for him. And uh, Chris came along and, and he was helping us. And then all of a sudden I start seeing this stuff that was embarrassing because he was berating Mark and just talking down to him and condescending. And it was just, the only way to explain it was it was embarrassing. I couldn't believe it. I look at Mark because, you know, that's the first time Mark and I met. I'm watching this go on and I'm just going, oh my God, how can he treat a human being like that? And it got so bad that the set was almost built and I excused myself, went outside and sat in the, in the truck. And I was even thinking to myself, I go, God, I hope he never treats me that way. And surely behold, after about four months of our friendship, I started seeing that. And uh, he would do that a lot at work. And then of course he would always come to me and apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry, sorry, Ray, I shouldn't have done how, you know, uh, uh, I had this, you know, that was going on. I shouldn't have done it, I apologize. And then pretty soon the apologies came constantly. Apologies don't mean anything anymore. Right, if you keep doing yeah, it. It's, it's one a, thing it's, if someone makes right. a mistake or, or yells, but then right. it's when it's consistent. That's when I started knowing I had to separate myself just a little bit, stay, be careful because He's a highly revengeful individual. It was a real hard atmosphere to work in. You kept up with that for many years. Yes. What was the catalyst for you leaving? Okay, so I'm going to call Bree really quick. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. So there's a few things. Obviously, as you know, Chris was fired this past Friday. And yeah. it's uh, pretty unbelievable to me how many of his coworkers have reached out after his termination to talk to us. And I mean, it appears that Austell's just making a move with their safety division, according to what Chris's email to the staff said. And so I'm kind of wondering what exactly is happening there, but it does seem like he does not work at Austell anymore, and the employees have been more vocal in talking to me. I think, though, it's still, we're still having a hard time getting people on the record. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, because I, I think they're still worried about being fired. But I think what's really cool is we have Ray Evans' interview, and I think he kind of 
says a, a lot of the same sentiment that the employees, the current employees are saying. Do you feel the same way? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> talking to him almost sums up what everybody else has told us. And I feel it's hard sometimes when we have one person come forward who's willing to be on the record and then that person was terminated from Austell. And so when we first interviewed Ray, I was a little bit nervous because now we only have one account and it's from someone who was terminated. But I feel like we've heard basically almost the same sentiment from about 15 employees, I would say, give or take a few there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so I feel like I think we're good to use his interview because I, I think it's a strong interview and I feel like we've been able to confirm a lot of the things he said by talking to other employees that are there. A year and a half before I was let go, they had an all-employee survey and they made it mandatory all employees had to participate in it. At first I was reluctant and didn't want to because our group was so small I knew I would be identified on any negative items put out there. And the way it was, it was meant to address management. And, you know, for the most of the hostel, it was perfect because, you know, if you had a manager, you probably had 400 people that worked in that manager's yeah. group. So to identify a person who's negative would have been tough. In my case, here you are. But after refusing a couple of times, you know, HR sent notices to me and said, you must participate and so forth. So I participated and I was very open and and it wasn't really nice, some of the things I said, but I was very open. And then they had a session where we talked like this with another person who's writing notes. And there were two of us in a room and we were guaranteed that they would never know what was said. Ended up being that uh, this individual leaked the information to him and then he called me in his office and was very clear of letting me know that he knew what I said and that I would regret it and that I would not know how it was gonna happen, but he'd get even. And then all of a sudden now they're creating a new position and then my position got cut and then mm. more responsibility got taken away and more responsibility taken away. Oh, shit. And then suddenly it was, we have budget cuts. And uh, I was selected. Yeah, so you didn't really believe it was budget oh, cuts. No. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's not at like all. just like an easy way to move sure. you along. You totally uh, equate it to that, that moment. Because he actually even brought me in his office and said it, that he knew. You, so when you guys were friends at first, kind of before you really had known about this kind of behavior, were you guys like hanging out, like going to each other's barbecues and stuff? Or? Yes, exactly. Okay. We were actually really good friends. Mm. I mean... Uh, go to his house a lot, uh, cook dinner for him, he cooked dinner for us, and, and we do things together as, you know, Carolyn and, and my wife and, and so forth. But then uh, as the attitude started being very caustic, it just, I couldn't do it anymore. To me, there was such difference because, you know, Carolyn was always such a sweetheart and she was very even killed, yeah. very even mannered. She was a thinker, you know, she actually thought things through mm -hmm. and, and, and tried to always smooth things over. She was a great person as a friend. She had a big heart. Did you see when they were, when you were just hanging out before it kind of got strained between you and Chris, did you, what was your impression of their relationship? I would see times when, you know, they were together um, and it seemed okay. But then again, because of where I worked and so forth, I would see Chris sometimes as much as once a day at least. And then suddenly I go in his office and, and he's has this, he's all upset and, and I go, well, what's wrong? He goes, oh, her, her cheese slid off the cracker again. He goes, I can't handle it anymore. And he'd start being upset. And that's when he would start telling me things that he, he, he was going to plan to do. And I asked him a lot of times, you know, why don't you just get divorced? He would say, I'm not going to lose everything. In my first divorce, I lost everything. And I'm not going to financially lose. I got too much to lose. What are some of the things that he would talk to you about with Carolyn or say out of anger or anything like that? What he would always talk about is, is how angry she'd get him, that suddenly she would just flip on him mm -hmm. and that he, he was you know, having trouble handling. He couldn't live like that anymore. He couldn't tolerate that, that anymore. He, he was fed up. And that if he could find a way to kill her and not get caught, he was going to do it. And it's one thing for a person to say that in a, in a fit of anger of to another person or to somebody else, you know, that I'm sure somebody, uh, normal human beings have done that. 
But when you see a person who's saying it constantly for over a year on a regular basis and in calm demeanor sometimes, hey, I can't handle this anymore. I got to find a way, you know, that I'm not going to get caught. You believe, first of all, if you know him, you believe it. The thing that really told me too that, that he had conviction in this is, is the one time he had a barbecue at his house and he invited one of the female safety officers to his house who brought her husband. He'd never met this man. Sat down and started having some drinks with him and talking to him. Before long, he's telling him how he wants to kill his wife if he can just find a way to do it and get away with it. Now, this guy, I happen to know, and I remember him telling me how uncomfortable he was because he said, that's the first time I met him. He said, I couldn't believe it. He says, he doesn't know me from anything and he's sharing this with me. Did it ever become to the point that you were so worried that you felt like someone should know about it? Because I wouldn't even know what I would do in that situation. I, I'm like you, I, I didn't really know what to do with it. I remember, you know, I got the news of, of uh, Carolyn's demise that I was, you know, right away, I, I kind of knew what happened. In fact, um, there was a, a young lady that, again, Carolyn's big heart, took someone in that didn't have a place to live for two weeks. Okay. And, um, she, Carolyn actually told this girl, and this was about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, that if anything ever happened to her, that Chris did it. 